What's up everybody, Dr. Rossi, shrinksandsneakers.com. I am finally getting to a topic that somebody requested from me a while back and I haven't had the time to make it, but today is the day. So we're gonna cover the topic of tics and Tourette's disorder. So tics and Tourette's disorder, we're gonna discuss that topic in depth and we're going to talk about diagnosis, treatment, the whole bit. So let's start with a basic introduction because not everybody knows a lot about these disorders and it's important to kind of put a couple things in perspective. So let's define what a tic is first. So a tic is a brief, recurrent, non-rhythmic, and it can be either motor or vocal, and it can be either simple or complex. And I'm going to explain all those things in the rest of the video. But let's just get that out there now that it could be simple or complex, it could be motor or vocal, and again, it's brief, recurrent, non-rhythmic. Non-rhythmic is actually an important point because there's other movement disorders that are more rhythmic. So Tourette's disorder is actually classified under the neurodevelopmental disorders in DSM-5. And basically, Tourette's disorder is characterized by what you might have already guessed, and that would be multiple motor and one or more vocal tics at any time during the illness, but not necessarily concurrently. So it's a lot to kind of remember there, but the main point to get is that it's characterized by multiple motor tics and at least one or more vocal tics. So you have to have, in order to have Tourette's disorder, you have to have motor and vocal tics there. And again, it doesn't necessarily have to be concurrently. So the tics they have to persist for at least one year because we give what's called a provisional tick disorder if they don't last for a year. And the reason being is a lot of times ticks are transient. They don't last very long. They go away on their own, no treatments required. And so we don't want to jump the gun and diagnose somebody with Tourette's disorder or a tick disorder before we know for sure that that's what it's going to be. It's impossible for us to predict whether or not this will be transient in nature. So we want to allow enough time. Another important point is the tics must occur before the age of 18. Now, what separates things like persistent motor or vocal tic disorder from Tourette's disorder is pretty much what I said at the beginning. Tourette's disorder requires motor and vocal tics. Persistent motor tic disorder would just be motor tics. And persistent vocal tic disorder would just be vocal tics. And I'll explain what constitutes, again, a simple and a complex uh, motor and vocal tic and what each of those will look like. Provisional tic disorder is characterized by tics that are present for less than a year, which is what I said just a minute ago, just explaining further that, you know, you have to have these tics for at least a year because we want to make sure that we're not making a premature diagnosis. The other thing to note about tics is that the volition behind a tic is somewhere between involuntary and voluntary. So it's not quite involuntary, but it's also not quite totally voluntary. So it's kind of an interesting in-between that I just want to point out here. So one of the things I'd like to do for you guys is point out a couple epidemiological points about the disorders when I'm describing them. So when I'm talking about tic disorder or Tourette's disorder, approximately 25% of children experience tics. So it's a pretty good number of kids will have a tic at some point in their lifetime. Now, Tourette's disorder is known to be highly heritable. So it's, it's genetic, there's a genetic component to this disorder. And it's affecting somewhere between 0.3% and 0.9% of the general population. And to put that in perspective, disorders like schizophrenia affect about 1% of the population, so this is 0.3 to 0.9 percent. The important comorbidities that I want to point out because these come up a lot whether you're taking a test in psychiatry or psychology and they're asking you these questions or just for your own knowledge if you're dealing with this disorder and you're wondering why maybe some of these comorbid psychiatric disorders occur with it. Approximately 50 percent of patients with Tourette's disorder are going to have obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD. And we have a video on that floating around somewhere on the channel, so check that out if you're interested in more about OCD. Approximately 50% of patients with Tourette's disorder will also have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, so ADHD. So the two most common comorbidities, psychiatric comorbidities with Tourette's or tic disorder, specifically Tourette's disorder, I'm sorry, will be, will be ADHD, 
and OCD. So look out for ADHD, OCD if you're dealing with, a, with Tourette's disorder. Now the management of Tourette's disorder is often less about the tics and more about the psychiatric comorbidities. So what people find more debilitating, what people find more loss of function with are the OCD and ADHD than they will with the tick itself. But it's not to say that these things are not problematic for people and they are not something that people want treated. So I promised you guys I would explain the classification of ticks that I talked about at the beginning of the video where I said that they can be organized into motor or vocal, simple or complex. So let's go over the simple motor ticks first because those are some of the most common things we see with Tourette's disorder or tick disorder. So what would be a simple motor tick? It could be things like eye blinking, grimacing, nose twitching, shoulder shrugs, head and arm jerks. And I actually had a friend when I was a kid who had the shoulder shrug, so every few seconds he would kind of go like this or something along those lines, kind of like roll his shoulder in his neck. And it was, it was a tick. And eventually I, I believe that that resolved, but the point is that those are simple motor ticks, that kind of grimacing, nose twitching, shoulder shrugging, head or arm jerks all fall into that category. Now if we're talking about complex motor tics, these are coordinated movements of multiple muscle groups. That's what makes it different. That's what makes it complex, obviously, is that you're dealing with multiple muscle groups and these are coordinated movements. So they may appear purposeful or slower, and these could be things like poking, pinching, punching, touching, uh, tapping, or rubbing. And you may see what's called echopraxia. So echopraxia is essentially mimicking others or mimicking others' movements. So you may see that as well as part of the complex motor tics. Now simple vocal tics, these are again the more common, I'd say, of, of the tics that you might see. Simple motor tics include things like sniffing, coughing, and throat clearing is a very, very common one. Grunting, barking, or animal sounds. So a little strange at the end there with the barking and animal sounds, but I think the throat clearing is the one that I would say is the most commonly seen. Now, of course, there can also be something called complex vocal tics. Now, complex vocal tics would be complex words or phrases that may include echolalia. And echolalia is a fancy term for repeating others or repeating what others have said. And also there's another one called palalalia, which is repeating oneself. So this person might repeat themselves or they might repeat others if they have complex vocal tics. Um, the last one to talk about is the one that maybe is most famous by TV and popular media, and that's the person that is unable to stop using profanity. They have a, they're, they're just screaming out all this, all these, uh, you know, profane words, and really uh, not very common. It's actually, it's actually very, very uh, uncommon. It's only seen in about 15% of cases, but it's often considered the uh, hallmark of Tourette's disorder, and again, not seen in most cases, and that's. Uh, coprolalia. So kind of weird terms, but again, it's, uh, it's interesting to kind of point out how those things differ and when you might see someone with this or if you might be experiencing it yourself, you can kind of put it into perspective and categorize it accordingly. Ticks often appear in younger ages, so it starts when kids are about five to seven years old. It gets worse in early adolescence, so it's actually at its worst during early adolescence between the ages of 10 and 14. And many people actually have this, these disorders resolved spontaneously by adulthood. So a lot of people with tic disorder or, not go, or Tourette's disorder are not going to have it by the time they reach adulthood. Tourette's is four times as common in male children, so again, males are more likely to be affected than females. About one-third of the cases resolve completely, a third of the cases improve and a third of the cases remain severe or actually get worse. So that's that theory of thirds and this is very common in psychiatry that like a third of people respond to the medication, a third of people or a third of people have remission with the medication, a third of people respond to the medication or have a good response and then a third don't have any response. It's the same here with Tourette's and tic disorder, a third, a third get better or completely resolve, a third improve and a third of people worsen. So there's also an important point to note here if you're doing any of the behavioral therapies for the treatment of tic disorder, and that is there's a premonitory urge 
And what I mean by that is that there's this itch or tension that only the tick can relieve. So the person experiences this, this itch, this tension to perform whatever motor or vocal tick will relieve that tension. Now, this is a target in the therapy, is which I'm going to talk about in a little bit. So the tick provides temporary relief. So if the person gives in and performs and performs the the, the activity, they perform the they do what they they have the tick happen, etc then it provides some temporary relief, but just like things like OCD, it's not enough, and so they have to continue. Now, behavioral therapy will target this urge for treatment where the medication will target the tick itself. So that's an important thing to note is that the behavioral interventions are targeting this urge or, or tension or itch, whereas the medication is going to target the tick itself. Ticks tend to wax and wane over time, and they can, of course, be exacerbated by things like stress fatigue and improved with coordinated movement or relaxation.